This lecture considers forced harmonic motion. This is a good subject where we can see the effects of damping. I would break the general area into single degree of freedom studies and multiple degree of freedom studies. It's best to start with a single degree of freedom or at least to concentrate on a single uh, component of motion such that you develop the time dependence of the various forces involved. Then when you go to multiple degree of freedom systems, you have to think about the spatial way that these forces are distributed over the body. By this time, we have a pretty good idea of spring-like forces and inertia forces, but we haven't really looked at damping forces yet, and that is a rather rich area of technology. There are whole symposia de devoted just to that topic of how do we set the damping coefficients, how do we measure them, and so forth. I'll use a phasor diagram concept, which comes from electrical engineering, to discuss the relationship both between the forces and the displacements in an um, oscillating mechanical system. Then we looked at forced harmonic motion. You can think of that as forced at a natural frequency or away from a natural frequency of the system. We look at damping in both the single degree of freedom and the multiple degree of freedom systems, and then finish with the problem session. We'll look at the phasor diagram first of all. This is a convenient vector way of looking at rotating vectors to represent a harmonic time dependence. The original physical body might be this potato-shaped body, which has these discrete forces acting on it at the nodes. The force field could de be defined then as this vector quantity F tilde, which could be a complex vector, times the e to the i omega t. Capital omega is meant to be an arbitrary frequency, not necessarily the natural frequency of the system. We can take a temporary notation here for breaking the F, capital F tilde into its magnitude and the phase angle. And that phase angle could vary from degree of freedom to degree of freedom in the system. So I've included several such phase angles. This common time dependence can be factored out. And if you now consider this as a set of complex vectors, and if we concentrate on just one of them, let's say there's a degree of freedom 7, which is horizontal at this node, for instance, U7, then the question is, uh, what are the forces on that degree of freedom? And there would be an amplitude A7 with some phase angle psi 7. This is shown with respect to um, a horizontal axis uh, as a leading phase. It might also be lagging, so we have to keep that in mind. We've defined our force field and shown a complex vector, which can be broken into magnitude and phase angles. Let's do the same thing for the resulting displacement field. U tilde will be our displacements, complex displacements at the nodal degrees of freedom. I'll again use a temporary notation here of a letter B with subscript and representing the specific response magnitude at a specific degree of freedom and then a phase angle Cn. If we pick that same degree of freedom 7, we would show this blue vector as the magnitude and then this C7 as the phase lead again. Normally, the force will be leading the response in a system, especially if there's only one force and one response involved. Later in a multiple degree of freedom system, this is not um, obvious and, and in fact doesn't happen in as much as you can have a number of forces at different phase angles and a number of responses at different phase angles.
Now let's look at the physics involved in a forced linear elastic system with damping. We're going to have the force vector acting on this multiple degree of freedom system, and we're going to have a response that depends on the relative magnitudes of the masses, damping, and the stiffnesses in the system. A general equation of motion is shown here. This could have been derived by other methods than finite elements, and often is. Many times it's derived by um, other uh, numerical methods such as uh, finite differences, or by boundary element methods, or other Rayleigh-Ritz approaches. Here I show a mass matrix, capital M, the nodal displacements with the acceleration, as shown as two dots. Here's the damping matrix B and the nodal velocities, the stiffness matrix K and the nodal displacements. On the right side, we have the live loads, F. And often in civil engineering, particularly, the constraint forces are um, taken as a separate vector here. But in mechanical engineering and aerospace and, and a number of others, we absorb that Q into the live loads and don't draw a distinction between live and reaction forces. The Symbol N is for any possible nonlinear forces. Sometimes those are externally applied. Sometimes these nonlinear effects are, in fact, internally elastic nonlinearities that are um, posed as if they were external and might be compensating for nonlinear material properties. So in general, this could be uh, due to a wide variety of causes. We're going to neglect that in our studies today. So below I show this, neglect the nonlinear forces, absorb the reactions into the live load vector. We find in this next figure that when the external force field is harmonic, that this allows you to do simple solutions in algebraic form. And the complex arithmetic is a big help. Here's our equation in a simplified form as we had discussed in the previous figure. We're using a force vector with harmonic time dependence and a uh, response displacement with a harmonic time dependence. We insert those proposed solutions here into the ordinary set of differential equations so that the response appears in this side. This is related to the method of undetermined coefficients where a person in a ordinary differential equation is able to guess the answer here pretty much based on the form of the forcing function over here. That's a legitimate process and, and very powerful, especially in these linear systems where a knowledge of the input to the problem often is useful in guessing the uh, information about the output. We cancel the common time dependence on both sides, all of the E, I, omega t's. And collecting the coefficients in the large parentheses, we get this relation. The derivatives have caused the minus omega squared and the I omega term to pop out as a pair of algebraic modifiers. We think of this whole quantity as a complex mechanical impedance and give it the symbol Z. Z depends on this frequency, capital Omega. Capital Omega is a measure of the frequency of the load, not of the frequency of the internal response. In this case, we will find, however, that the two are linked together because it's a linear system and a particularly nice forcing function. Were this a nonlinear system, we would have found that this cap omega originally associated with the 
force on the right uh, might cause several different kinds of frequencies in the interior of the system. In that case, those are called superharmonics and subharmonics. It's really only in a nice linear system like this that we have the luxury of imposing a frequency on the right side and seeing it with perfect clarity reproduced in the response on the left side. If we use that symbol Z as a complex impedance, our equation simplifies greatly as shown below. This equation is commonly used in structures all around the world. Everyone knows it and loves it. Other fields where there are oscillatory processes would have similar equations. Acoustics, let's say, or electromagnetics. Now we need to sweep out the frequency response curve by evaluating this response at each of a number of discrete frequencies. The formal expression is given here, but we know that actually that's done by triangular factorization of the impedance matrix. This is similar to a static solution by a direct solver. So the user will pick a set of frequencies that are sufficient to map out a response curve. These are often done in terms of the frequency in hertz rather than uh, the circular frequency omega. You solve that problem, say m times, and plot some measure of the amplitude response as in this upper curve. Here I'm showing an absolute value. You should do that so that the phase sense is carried by the phase angle. So this is basically a polar concept in complex arithmetic. That way you don't get a abrupt change in the location of this um, uh, hill here because of a, a sign change. Below I have also plotted the complex impedance uh, in the absolute value and we see that of course when the impedance is a minimum that's where the response is a maximum. At this minimum you find the inertia and damping terms are canceling out some of the inherent static stiffness. So the mechanical system is not as stiff at some of these higher frequencies as it is at zero frequency. And of course that's what leads to the resonance shown above. The frequency response approach that we are discussing here is very important in several technical fields. Airplanes, ships, automobiles, these all have a power source that's a reciprocating engine or at least a rotating piece of machinery that is located at a specific point in that structure. The frequencies can change in time and that's why you need to map out the whole frequency response curve to understand your system. Those problems are a little different than that say in the missile industry where you have a rocket engine and if you've heard of the crackling noise of a, of a rocket out in cold air, you know that there are many frequencies involved there. Other systems for which this might not be appropriate could perhaps be something like a bridge where you had a moving load, uh, cars that are moving in space, rather than a um, harmonic force applied at one specific point. So for those technical fields where this concept is relevant, it really is simple and it's useful under these kinds of cases, uh, automotive, aircraft. It shows the character of the system because if you put on a constant force magnitude over a range of frequencies, then you pick up the resonant points. These, of course, are close to the um, natural frequency Let's focus our attention now on damping. Damping is very important in the structure. It governs the amplitude at resonance. In other words, the real damage that's done if your system is subjected to a frequency um, that corresponds to an internal frequency. 
So in other words, if the driving force happens to coincide with a frequency at which the structure wants to vibrate, then you can have trouble. One classic case was an automobile made in Detroit where the right passenger seat in the front had a resonance at the same frequency as the idling frequency of the engine. That meant that when a person pulled up to a stoplight and idled, the right front seat started to shake uh, in a resonant mode and uh, with large amplitude. I have a friend who had a car like that and found that it was very disturbing because it moved some six or eight inches uh, flopping around. Damping is due to a number of physical mechanisms. Uh, your initial thought might be that it would be internal to the material, but actually most of the damping occurs at joints where there is looseness and friction uh, in that joint. There are um, some forms of damping at cut edges, particularly acoustic radiation can, can damp down a very thin structure. Then if you have internal uh, 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 fuel tanks, you can get damping. Or if your system is a submarine and working with an external fluid around it, of course, that also has a uh, large damping effect. There's not much doubt about the time dependence part of damping forces. They tend to oppose motion. They tend to directly oppose the uh, velocity of the system. That's true for the uh, viscous and uh, structural damping and uh, coulomb damping as well. Now, you have, to, you have to say a little more about that. How does it directly oppose the motion? And for the harmonic system, uh, that will allow us to say more in terms of phasor diagrams. When you have multiple degree of freedom systems, the spatial distribution that you get is a little more trouble because some kinds of physical damping are distributed throughout the structure according to where the mass is. Other damping types are distributed more where the stiffness distribution. And then those that are due to external um, fluid forces on surfaces might have to do a surface area, so-called wetted area, and, and so on. Now there's some simplifications made on this. Rayleigh was able to make such a simplification years ago, and that's one way to help out in this particularly um, troublesome area, considering the spatial distribution of damping forces. We're going to study damping first by looking at a single degree of freedom system. If we cause that single degree of freedom system to move in a harmonic displacement, then we can relate the force to that displacement through phasor diagrams. This is an obvious thing to do with a linear single degree of freedom system, and that works nicely for structural damping and viscous damping. We're also going to cycle a nonlinear system through harmonic motion without saying how we could do that, uh, merely imposing a constraint on the uh, displacement field to make it harmonic in time. So that's a common thread through what we're going to do here is a harmonically moving system. Now, we're going to do this by impressing a harmonic load on the um, linear systems and then get this harmonic displacement as a result. The phasor diagram on the left here is the kinematic quantities, displacement, velocity, acceleration. Note that these are 90 degree changes here from one to the other. Mathematically, you can get that by multiplying uh, by the imaginary number i. In the phasor concept, these three are presumed to be rotating counterclockwise with the frequency of both the applied force and the response. I've also put on this figure the dashed line showing the external force and with the suggestion here that it leads the response, which would be typical of a single degree of freedom system. In fact, that external force could either be nearly in phase or nearly 180 degrees leading. 
So that's the range over which the external force can lead the response in a single degree of freedom system. Now the forces are described by a second phasor diagram on the right, and the external force will be balanced by inertial, elastic, and damping forces. And these directions are pretty well fixed then in terms of, uh, especially for viscous and um, uh, structural damping, in that the damping force is going to directly oppose, in sense, the velocity over here in the first phasor diagram. Uh, then the elastic forces are, are known to oppose the elastic deformations U. The inertia forces um, through F equals MA are known to oppose the acceleration uh, vector over here. So um, the main argument seems to be for, at least for linear systems, is how long is this vector here? I'm going to use the classic symbols up on the uh, figure to the uh, right here of a spring K with a this jagged uh, lightning-like uh, uh, character. And then a cloud here, not knowing yet what kind of damping we're going to put on. And then a uh, mass here, which is presumed to be up at a point. So it's a concentrated mass. The force is applied to the mass downward, and the uh, displacement that results is also downward. So these are uh, of the same sign convention. Let's study viscous damping in more detail now. Viscous damping has historically been the chief academic learning tool for damping. And it has many practical applications, particularly if there are uh, fluids involved in the, in the system. I would say it's being overshadowed today by structural damping, which is the one that's more commonly used in build-up structures. But let's look at viscous damping very carefully. The force that you get when you move a body that has viscous damping on it is um, a negative force opposing the velocity. And then there's a coefficient of proportionality, and we'll use this lowercase b here. In the figure on the right, I'm showing that damping force opposing the velocity, and I'm presuming that the body is, is uh, moving downward, that it has positive displacement down, positive velocity, and positive acceleration. That's a common way that one would draw such a free body diagram as I have on the right. Free body diagram. Um, this kind of damping is literally true if you take a can full of oil and then maybe take the lid off and, and weld it to a rod and then oscillate the rod up and down in a full can of oil. We did this back at the master's level and it works out beautifully. You really get viscous damping from that. So something paddle shaped that's moving in fluid is definitely going to have some viscous effects. And because of that, engineers have used universally this dash pot symbol to indicate that there's a viscous damper in play. And of course you're already familiar with the uh, spring-like uh, figure for an elastic force system. Now the inertia we show is a, is a vector uh, opposing the acceleration upward. So basically you get the sign sense from this free body diagram and the differential equation shown on the left. Um, in fact, what you're really doing is connecting two points, which either of which might move by a viscous damper, and that you really probably need to show the damper as a uh, force dependent on the relative motion of these two velocities, and then accounting for a proper sign here. Um, this is the way that we Now for this linear system, I'm going to impose a harmonic external force and then the system will oscillate in a harmonic way. Here we have the force, here we have the displacement, and then we can calculate the viscous force shown here. 
there's several important things to notice. One is the, quote, you might say direction of the force, uh, which would be in the phasor diagram for forces straight down. Um, but the important thing I'm trying to point in, in this figure is that you have a proportionality to omega and that the viscous force itself changes as frequency changes. Now, if you follow the motion of the system then, and you put a sensor on the system that reads displacement, and you put this on a cathode ray tube, you would find your harmonic motion would tend to move this point of light back and forth like, forth like this. Now, if we put a second transducer on that measures the viscous force shown on the vertical axis, this figure will open up into a so-called Lissajou figure. And this time you'll find that when there is positive motion, in other words, going this way, that your viscous force is going to be negative uh, in, in the single direction we're thinking of will be down below and uh, have a negative value. So actually you progress around a circle in the Lissajou figure in this way. The area enclosed therein would be related to the work done during one cycle of motion. It would be force through a distance. The interesting thing in viscous damping is if you do this faster, then the Lissajou figure opens up because the force gets higher. So that the area under a curve like this grows and you do more damping per cycle of closed motion through one cycle of motion. But it's more serious than that because you're doing more cycles per second as you go at a faster frequency. And so viscous damping is very effective at making motion subside at high frequencies. And you could understand that if you threw a vibrating ping pong ball into a barrel of molasses. You wouldn't expect it to vibrate very long. So um, viscous damping has a double whammy on Let's now look at structural damping. Uh, structural damping is being widely used today in the study of response of built-up structures. We define it in the context of harmonic motion. Once you go to non-harmonic motion, it's a little harder to discuss it, and it's really not as appropriate, although it's used as an approximation in multi-degree of freedom systems. There's no uh, problem in figuring out the sense of the uh, damping force when you have structural damping because it opposes the, the velocity. And so on this uh, phasor diagram below, this is the vector pointing straight down. The interesting thing is that it's been found by experiment many years ago at MIT by uh, Ted Pian and others that the magnitude of this vector here is proportionate to the size of the structural force over here. And that's been confirmed in tests where the uh, correlation is excellent. Uh, the eye carries the uh, phase relation here so as to show that this vector, in fact, leads by 90 degrees this vector. And then there's a proportionality coefficient g here that's universally used for structural damping. If you look at that formula that we just wrote down for structural damping force, you find that there is no frequency uh, explicitly called out there. This force goes um, uh, with magnitude uh, GKU. Uh, of course, you need the phase relation to properly orient it with respect to the, uh, this uh, time base here. But there is no omega appearing in that, no, no driving force. So in this case, as you form a Lissajou figure on an oscilloscope, you find that you trace out this ellipse here. And the faster you go, um, nothing happens. <laughs> you get the same area. So the amount of energy that is absorbed per unit cycle remains the same. However, structural damping will also tend to uh, dissipate higher 
frequency oscillations because there will be more of those cycles per unit time. So uh, structural damping does work on higher frequencies, but uh, really not as effectively as viscous damping can. And the uh, physical nature of this is due to uh, joints, uh, material damping, anything where you have a rubbing process in the structure. The cleanest structure that I ever saw was a all-welded power pole for Detroit Edison. And as I'm remembering, the structural damping was 002. Now, roughly speaking, that means that when you resonate that, you get 500 times the uh, effect of a static force of the same magnitude. Um, automotive structures tend to have Gs closer to uh, 0.05, and that was the number that Bendix Aerospace System used on a, um, uh, a payload on a missile, on a Minuteman missile that was made up of a lot of, a uh, lot of uh, riveted joints. So I think if you don't know what to do, you have to guess uh, structural damping coefficient somewhere between maybe 0.02 and 0.05, depending on how many joints are in the structure. And I wouldn't use something like this 0.002 that was an entirely all welded structure and very, very tightly tuned that way, so badly so that the wind resonated it and it dropped off its cross arms. Our fourth type of damping is called Coulomb damping. This really causes a nonlinear response, and so uh, I'm going to enforce harmonic motion when it comes time to discuss a Lissajous figure that you might create through experiment. It opposes velocity and has a magnitude that does not depend on the kinematics of the motion except for the sign of the velocity. And so uh, Coulomb friction has a constant of proportionality C here that depends typically on clamping friction between two surfaces and then the minus the sign of the velocity. So whatever sign the velocity has, then this force is going to oppose it on this simple system here. The force when done in a very slow manner will change with velocity in this way. Some of you may also know that depending which way you go, if the system's at rest in, in, or moving in one direction, let's, let's suppose you've brought it to rest. That's probably the best way to look at it. And then if I try to go with a negative velocity, sometimes you'll get an overshoot, uh, which is called sometimes a static coefficient of friction, which might be some 30% you know, higher than this, uh, this dynamic coefficient of friction that we're discussing. Likewise, if you tried to move from a still uh, rest point and then accelerate to the right, um, by the time it broke free, it would have given an overshoot there as well. Now, Coulomb damping doesn't depend on frequency, so that makes it similar to the structural damping. Uh, and there are static values involved when the thing is clamped just prior to breaking free. Uh, this rather abrupt change uh, that is shown here is characteristic of nonlinear systems, though, because you don't get small changes causing small effects. You get small changes, such as a velocity change, causing very large effects. Let's do look at the Lissajous figure that you would get in the same experiment that we've discussed earlier, where you measure displacement on the horizontal axis and frictional force on the vertical. This is our Coulomb force here. As you start out um, moving to the right, there's no change as you increase uh, displacement uh, through a normal harmonic cycle. And then when you uh, come to rest at the extreme part of this cycle, remember we're moving harmonically on this horizontal axis now. So you come to rest when you hit to the right edge here. So this will stop and, and will drop to zero, but then will build up as you reverse and possibly overshoot a little bit. So there might be a little ear there. Then you'll travel back along this side, back down, possibly overshoot a little before you uh, reach that point. But the area under here is not dependent on frequency, and uh, you get a square area this time. Um, 
I guess some people might say, well, then it would be a little more effective than structural damping. Yes, but not a lot. Um, and I think the two are somewhat related physically because they both have to do with friction in joints primarily uh, and, and, and can have other sources too. It's useful to be able to compare the viscous damping coefficient and the structural damping coefficient at any driven frequency, capital omega. We'll do this by taking the viscous equation of equilibrium here, where the damping is proportionate to velocity. When you put in the harmonic time dependence, you pop out an I omega term on the damping and a minus omega squared on the inertia terms. The structural problem is inherently defined here as a harmonic situation, although I've written a general equation here, which is a little shaky because it's really only true for harmonic motion. But in this harmonic version, which is uh, appropriate, now the damping appears on the displacement term, but with a phase lead I. And the, again, the inertia term has a minus uh, omega squared behavior. In order for these two types of damping to give the same damping effect at a given frequency, capital omega, we can equate those coefficients then uh, that appear. The Kig u here has to be the same as the i omega b u up here. Since u is the same in both cases, we cancel it and we get this parametric relation. And when you treat g as the known and solve in this direction for equivalent viscous damping, then you have this general relation. And this is valid at all driven frequencies omega. Later, we will make some comparisons between viscous damping and structural damping that